Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Magnus Lofstrom, and I am uh, Policy Director of Criminal Justice and Senior Fellow with the Public Policy Institute of California. I want to thank you for tuning in to our program today, featuring the findings of a new PPIC report, Racial Disparities in Traffic Stops. I'd like to also thank Arnold Ventures for their support of this research, as well as today's event. And for today's programs, I will present the key findings from our report and then invite my colleague Brandon Martin to moderate the discussion with a panel of experts. And if you're interested in learning more of the report, policy brief and technical uh, appendices, as well as the slides from today's presentation are available on our website at ppic.org. Also been asked to share a couple of housekeeping items before uh, I start today's program. Uh, PPIC is a public charity and does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidate, candidates for public office. Importantly, at the end of today's event, we have set aside some time to answer audience questions. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please send an email to the address on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And please include your name and organization along with your question. And with that, I'm going to start my presentation. So I wanna begin by um, pointing out that this is joint work with my colleagues, Joe Hayes, Brandon Martin, and Deepak Prem Kumar. Um, there are notable, racial inequities throughout the criminal justice system um, in California, as well as uh, throughout the nation. And California has taken steps to uh, reduce racial disparities in policing, including increased, um, increased transparency. And in 2015, uh, California passed the Racial uh, Identity and Profiling Act, often uh, called uh, RIPA. Uh, and what it means is that it uh, mandates all law enforcement agencies by 2023 to collect data on all stops made, detailed information on all stops made, report these to the California Department of Justice who will make these then publicly available. And this provides a rich and unique source on, on, on stops as well as on disparities in policing. And these are data that we have used in the past for our work. And it includes findings from the report that was released in 2020, where we found, maybe not surprisingly, that people of color have different experiences in searches, enforcement, intrusiveness, and use of force compared to white residents. And the, and the differences are especially notable when we make comparisons between black and white uh, Californians. We do find that differences in the stop context as well as the jurisdiction contribute to some of these disparities. But even after we account for those kind of factors, we're still seeing inequities. And then importantly for the work that I'm sharing with you here today, traffic stops we found are a key driver of these disparities. So in this report, we ask whether certain traffic stops could be enforced in alternative ways. And we try to answer this question by examining these traffic stops by the time of the day, by the type of law enforcement agency, as well as by the type of uh, traffic violation. And ideally, these alternative enforcement methods would improve officer as well as civilian safety, reduce racial disparities, enhance police efficiency, and do all of this without jeopardizing public safety. So in order to answer these questions and provide some information, we use RIPA data on 3.4 million traffic stops made by the state's 15 largest law enforcement agencies in 2019. Uh, this includes uh, California Highway Patrol, the eight largest police departments, and the six largest sheriff departments in California. And these data quite quickly point us in direction of nighttime stops made by a local law enforcement uh, as being of special interest. And what we see is that more than half of traffic stops made by local uh, 
police and sheriff departments between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. There are for non-moving violations. So that includes improper displays of displays of license plates, uh, invalid uh, vehicle registration, as well as uh, uh, broken uh, uh, taillights, for example. We also see that while the vast majority of traffic stops lead to some sort of enforcement here being defined as at least a warning is, is being issued. We see that there are about 211,000 stops, or roughly 6% of all traffic stops, which did not result in any enforcement or any discovery of, of contraband in the event that was search was being made. About half of these happened in the late p.m., early a.m. hours. Most of them were made by police department and most were for uh, non-moving violations. And then in total, officers spent about 80,000 hours on these stops. They didn't lead to any enforcement or, uh, or any discovery of contraband and are likely to be a subset of what's called pretextual uh, stops. We also see that law enforcement, and, and these are mostly local police officers, do confiscate firearms. We saw that that was the case in 905 traffic stops in uh, 2019. And that about half of these were in stops for non-moving violations. So if we turn to what we see in terms of racial disparity in these data, uh, what we see is that largest racial disparities occur around midnight in the hours before and after, and especially in stops by police. So what this figure shows you here uh, is the racial distribution by the stop hour. And specifically in this case, we're limiting this to the police department, which is where we're seeing the, uh, the uh, largest disparities. And these here, this is by the, uh, the time of the day, and this is in a 24 hour clock or military clock. So for example, here, this is 8 p.m. And what the data is showing us is that at 8 p.m., 15% of traffic stops made by police departments are of white drivers, 47% are of Latino drivers, 30% are of black drivers, and 3% are of Asian drivers. So most notable here is, is that we have in these hours, the share of black drivers are at least uh, twice what it is of, of white drivers. And then if we next look at what these kind of experiences look at, look like, focusing at first on searches, and what I'm showing you here now are the differences in the likelihood of being searched between black and Latino drivers compared to uh, white drivers. And these are these solid lines here. And the fact that all of this, this is again throughout the day, uh, the entire lines here lie above zero shows us that throughout the day, Black and Latino drivers are more likely to be searched than white drivers. But these differences are especially notable here in the, in the evening and late evening hours. And here roughly what we see is that about one in 10 white driver at those hours is being searched. And that's about one in five Latino drivers and one in four uh, black drivers. And then on these dashed lines here below, we show you the differences in the likelihood that the officer found some contraband or evidence, so-called discovery rate. And what you see here is um, that throughout the day, the officers are actually less likely to find contraband or evidence in searches of black and Latino drivers compared to white drivers. And then um, returning to these, these stops where there's no discovery and, and no enforcement and looking at when they take place and what the racial distribution is. We see that black drivers make up notably higher shares of, of nighttime stops of the, uh, when there is no discovery and enforcement. So for example, now here, I'm gonna just point out what happens at 3 a.m. In these stops where there's no enforcement, no discovery, four, uh, about 14% are white drivers, 42% are Latino drivers and 39% are black drivers and about 3% are Asian uh, drivers. So again, it's quite notable this disparity uh, between, especially between black drivers and, and white drivers. 
Next, if we look at what these kind of uh, stops when there is no discovery of contraband and there's no enforcement, we see that there are a number of these 211,000 stops that involve some intrusive actions. In almost 50,000 of them, uh, the person was asked to step out of the vehicle. In a little bit more than 35,000 of them, there was a curbside or patrol car uh, detention. And in almost 15,000, uh, the person was handcuffed. And then lastly, there are a few incidents, 361, that involves the officer's uh, weapons. And again, it shows that no matter what kind of intrusive action we're looking at, that compared to the state population, the share of, 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 our, of Californians who are black, 6%, black drivers who have these kind of intrusive experiences are, are, are greatly overrepresented. Uh, so for example, there are about 35% of these no discovery, no enforcement stops, uh, 35% are black, again, compared to the state population of 6%. And these are, I should point out, this is not limited to police. This is these stops that we're presenting here are for CHP police as well as sheriff departments. And while racial bias is one possible reason for disparities, there's possible that some other factors may contribute. Uh, for example, vehicle conditions and driving patterns that are due to uh, work and school schedules and leisure may differ across race, ethnicity, and, and especially uh, time of the day. So in order to uh, try to shed some light on the possibility of racial bias, we're gonna test for that in one specific stop outcome, and that is the likelihood of being stopped. And we're going to apply something that is called the veil of darkness theory that basically says that light conditions affect an officer's ability to determine the race ethnicity of a driver. And that in dark conditions, it makes it more difficult for an officer to determine that race and that ethnicity of a driver. And if that's the case, that racial bias is behind the decision to stop someone, you'd expect them in these darker conditions when it's more difficult uh, to determine that, that the share of, of, for example, say black drivers would actually decrease that. I want to point out that the kind of comparisons across day and night doesn't credibly reveal pattern. Those patterns don't necessarily reveal that racial bias because of these possible confounding factors. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use a unique uh, situation to, to examine this likelihood. So we're going to examine the effects of the sudden changes in light conditions that at any given times, both in the morning and the evening, coincides with daylight saving time switches that take place in March and November of every year. So for example, if we're looking at March and in the morning hours, and depending on where you are in California, I'll say around between six and seven in the morning um, in March, uh, before, right before we switch uh, to daylight savings, those are actually, uh, we have light conditions, but right after that, those are dark conditions. And then in the evening, you have the opposite. We have more light in the evening. So that means now we're looking at, depending on, again on where you are, between 6.30 and 7.30, um, it switches from being dark to light. And so what we're doing here is we're looking at uh, the two week period before and after these daylight savings time switches uh, to see if the share of drivers who are black or Latino uh, if that changes we, with this switches. And given that we're using both the morning and the evening at, in, in March and November, we can also, we can observe switches in both directions, giving predictions in different directions of what the share should be if uh, racial bias is present according to the veil of darkness theory. And what we see is that there is evidence of racial bias in stop decisions among local law enforcement. We see, for example, in those hours when the light conditions switch from light to dark, when it makes it more difficult for the officer to determine the race and ethnicity, we see that those shares actually drop. These are the estimated percentage point shares. When we combine Black and Latino, it's 2.2 percentage point 
uh, fewer uh, people of color who are being stopped. Um, and they, this is when we break them out separately. And these are statistically significant. And then when we're looking at those hours when there is a switch from dark to light with the veil of darkness theory predicts that uh, that that would increase then the share of, of people of color who are being stopped. We see that that's the case as well, I hear. All right, so putting this all together, what it does uh, show is that nighttime traffic stops made by local law enforcement to serve particular considerations. And we say that because these stops, they're predominantly for non-moving violations. They involve higher search rates than daytime stops, but discovery rates are lower. They're also more likely to lead to no enforcement or a no discovery. And then importantly, this is when we see the greatest and where we see the greatest racial disparities. Um, but we do, however, find that uh, firearms are confiscated a number of, of these uh, stops. So if we then look at what does this mean in terms of policy con uh, considerations? So if we start with alternative enforcement methods and looking at non-moving violations, uh, mailing warnings or citations to the registered owner of the vehicle would be one such alternative enforcement. And for moving violations, uh, red light cameras and automated speed cameras, although the latter is not legal in California, those are the kind of alternative enforcement that have been found to reduce violations and also reduce crashes. So while these are possible alternative enforcement that could improve uh, and reduce the uh, improve or increase the safety of both civilians and officers and reduce racial disparity, it's also possible that these methods may also reduce the number of firearms confiscated. And lastly, we are seeing some evidence of racial bias, at least when it comes to the likelihood of being stopped. Um, what are some policy consideration there? Uh, impl implicit bias training is something that is relatively commonly applied, but the research support for its effectiveness is not very strong. But there are evidence-based practices, and that includes diversifying police staff, and while recruitment is one way to do that, that might be challenging and may also uh, take time. Researchers also found that reallocating officers to calls from the same race, ethnicity, neighborhoods is another way to um, reduce racial bias and actually uh, improve public safety as well. So those are some considerations. With that, I'm gonna stop this. And I wanted to um, remind you all that if you have questions for our panelists, um, to please send these questions to the uh, email on your screen here, which is ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And please do remember to include your name and organization as, as well. And with that, I oh, now want to. Uh, uh, and welcome my colleague and research associate, Brandon Martin, to join me. Brandon? Thank you, Magnus. I would now like to welcome our panelists. Their full bios can be found on the PPIC event page. So in the interest of time, I will do just brief introductions. First, I'd like to welcome Assembly Member Kevin McCarthy, McCarthy, who currently represents parts of Sacramento and Yolo County in the California State Assembly. Thank you, Assembly Member, for participating today. Thank you. Thank Next, I'd like to welcome Abdul Pridgen, who is the Chief of Police of the San, for the San Leandro Police Department and currently a member of the State Racial and Identity Profiling Advisory Board. Thank you, Chief, for participating today. My pleasure. And I'd now like to introduce our third panelist, Adriana Wong. Adriana is a Senior Staff Attorney and Statewide Lead of Police Practices with the ACLU of Southern California. Thank you, Adriana, for participating today. Thank you for inviting me. And now that I have introduced all of our panelists, let's begin our discussion. Magnus's presentation and the report contained a number of findings regarding traffic stops and racial disparities. So to start, I'd like to give each of you a few minutes to take a chance to talk about your general reaction to the report and any notable takeaways either from the report or the presentation that you'd like to share for the audience. For this, I'm going to start with Assemblymember McCarty first. 
Thank you and good morning. Uh, appreciate this conversation and thank you to PPIC for one, uh, being at the forefront for having uh, top conversations on important topics, not always easy topics. And secondly, thank you for the research on this. Um, before my conclusion, just a quick sec on how we got here. Uh, this was a bill that was put forward in 2015 by Dr. Shirley Weber. I was proud to help uh, support this and push it across the finish line. This was a top priority of the Legislative Black Caucus and we made it um, a major, major push. This was not easy. Um, the governor at the time, Brown, was not supportive. This was a heavy opposition from law enforcement. Um, this idea had been introduced three or four times over the 10 years or so before and never made it or vetoed every time. So this was many years in the making. And, and, and you know, at the time, law enforcement says, one, this is unneeded. It would be too uh, burdensome on officers, won't be able to do their job. And three, that evidence and research will show that there is no racial profiling. There is no anomaly in the number of uh, traffic stops and so forth in the population of California. And you can go to the arguments opposition, that's clearly what they said. And this what report finds is why we pushed the bill in the first place. Because uh, we knew that when you did the research and dug down deep, there was um, a difference, a quantifiable difference between who gets pulled over and what the overall population looks like of communities across California. So uh, this certainly um, illuminated that crystal clear. I don't think there's much debate and frankly, more than, more than um, I had thought, you know, um, in some of these areas, as we said by the researchers, double the predicted amount that you should have um, um, African-Americans, for example, pulled over in certain communities. And so, you know, that certainly pops out. Um, and I guess the other thing too is, it, it shows that um, these are many times we see these horrific instances on um, you know, video where unnecessary force by law enforcement when our officer crossed the line and you dig back into what was the reason the, the person was pulled over, many times it's for a trivial reason in the first place. So we put the public at unnecessary risk many times. Frankly, we put officers sometimes at unnecessary risk. So the real question is what do we do going forward? And I think there are innovative things that we can do as far as some of the lower level um, in, um, offenses and ways we could send notices or do um, other ways to um, basically hold people accountable for, for those uh, violations. Um, but also, you know, when we do have stops, you know, how do we, you know, bring out the appropriate people in the first place. You know, if it's a, an instance related to a mental health, for example, how do we make sure we have those individuals that are responding to the calls? But I think this does illuminate the issue. It says it is, is real. We do have uh, racial bias in our, in our stops by law enforcement. And it really going forward, it's about what policymakers like me and others are going to do to fix this. Thank you. Chief Pridgen? Well, good morning. Again, thank you for having me. I'm uh, honored to be a part of this really important discussion. And I will say first and foremost, I thought it was an interesting and novel approach to determining potential bias in traffic stops based upon daylight savings time. I uh, will also say that I'm not surprised that potential disparities exist. And I don't think any of us should be. Uh, in every institution in America, there are disparities that exist for black people and people of color. Um, and coming from another state where they began collecting racial profiling data in 2001. It has been consistent for the last 21 years that black people and people of color are stopped more frequently, are searched more frequently, and in most cases, less contraband is recovered. So it was no surprise that this theme is consistent here in California. And that's not an indictment on the good men and women that are out there doing their jobs. It's really just a testament that they're human beings and they're influenced by the society that we live in. And I think it was Dr. Jennifer Everhart, who said that black males in America are equated with danger, threat, aggression, and crime. And just to point out that it's not just in law enforcement, but I was reading an article about uh, the US Customs um, where they searched black and Latinos 43% of the time, but contraband was found more, more frequently on whites. So again, this is a common theme and this is something that has been challenging law enforcement for many years. I'm encouraged by the fact that the California Police Chiefs Association is trying to lean in and uh, support policies that 
ensure a safe community and also hold officers accountable. A couple of things that surprised me in this uh, research was that roughly half or like 51% of guns were confisca confiscated as a result of non-moving violations. I didn't think it would be that high. And then the number of hours spent on non-enforcement, non-discovery stops and speaking you know, from a perspective where we have strained resources and many departments do, there's a way that maybe we can better allocate our resources if that is not proving to be helpful in keeping our community safe. And, and also it's an opportunity for those who are married to intelligence led and data driven policing to have conversations with their community about these outcomes and ways that we can mitigate outcomes that disparately impact blacks and people of color. So I, I thought it was real. Again, not a surprise, but an opportunity to figure out how we can have these conversations with our communities to mitigate the impact uh, and disparate impacts to blacks and people of color. Thank you, Chief. Adriana? Thank you. Um, thank you to PPIC for inviting me and, and thank you to Magnus for that very detailed and interesting um, summary of the report. My general impression of the report is that it confirms across agencies things that I've already known about individual police departments for some time through my work with uh, in coalition with community organizations specifically impacted by these kinds of stops and through my work as a litigator that works on racial profiling cases, namely that many traffic stops are pretextual, that there are gross racial disparities in who is stopped, who is searched and how intrusive those stops and searches are. Uh, one thing in the report that I found particularly striking, though, was that something like 0.002% of the stock uh, that PPIC examined resulted in recovery of a contraband firearm. So that's like three zeros after the decimal point. And of course, the rates of finding contraband are even lower when we look at stops and searches of Black individuals. So to me, that demonstrates how pretext stops are not only racist, but woefully inefficient when we are talking about serving public safety especially when you consider how our continuous commitment of resources and focus to these attempts to find a needle in the haystack may be costing us opportunities to pivot to strategies that are more efficient, more solutions oriented, and in general work better for safety, approaches focused on addressing the root causes of problems like gun crime, for example. Uh, and the ineffectiveness of this widespread practice is even more troubling when you consider the public safety harms on the other side of the balance that result from the erosion of public trust, not only in police, but public institutions more broadly, when armed law enforcement saturate particular neighborhoods like an occupying force and repeatedly subject people to stops based on justifications everyone knows are dishonest, as well as the risk of police violence in every traffic stop. And the PPIC report uh, does a great job documenting the hundreds of thousands of stops serving no law enforcement purpose where people are pulled out of their cars, handcuffed, thrown into the back of squad cars, forced to sit or lie down on the sidewalk. Because we have to recognize that the physical injuries, the dignitary harms, the trauma and emotional harm, and in the worst cases, loss of life that results from police interactions like this are threats to the well being of our communities as well, if we're going to weigh the public safety costs and benefits of this practice. Thank you, Adriana. Um, you know, the report and Magnus also mentioned in his presentation that cities such as Berkeley, LA, and San Francisco have already proposed changes to enforcing non-moving violations, such as lack of registration or improper display of a license plate. And so since I have you here, I'm, I'm really hoping that anyone could chime in on, you know, are there certain types of traffic violations that you envision could be enforced in alternative ways, like specific actual violations? And, and what obstacles slash considerations uh, do we need to be addressed when when changing that enforcement that that we might not know about? Um, I don't have any particular order. I'm just hoping anyone can jump in if they'd like. This is Abdul, and I'll jump in. So I think it'll be interesting to see the results of what Berkeley and other cities are doing, and quite frankly, the state of Virginia. I know that they um, prohibited pretextual stops. I think in 2021. So what's going to be important is because the first response you'll get from law enforcement is that's going to negatively impact crime. I don't know that it will, and I don't know that anybody has an idea of whether it will or not, but looking at these cities who are uh, proactively leaning into alternative approaches, and if they can demonstrate that it has no negative impact on crime, and as a matter of fact, maybe you get better cooperation from community members who have particularly um, felt 
disenfranchised or marginalized. Now they feel that there's a greater level of trust and want to share information with you. Maybe it'll lead to more crimes being solved. So I'm really looking to these um, forward-leaning agencies to see what the outcomes are and even the state of Virginia, because it could be a lesson for others to, to emulate. Again, the pushback you'll get from law enforcement is we're concerned that this could negatively impact crime. Well, let's test it and it's being tested. And let's see what the outcome is. And I think if there are positive results, that's an example of how it can be implemented in a way that doesn't adversely impact public safety. And, you know, as you mentioned, I think with traffic citations or for registration being uh, mailed to people, the only thing I see from a law enforcement standpoint is people are probably going to say, well, what if it's not the registered owner? Now we've got to spend a whole lot of time to get it to the real person who owns the car because it was sold three times from the last time it was registered. And that's uh, going to be a strain on our resources, that kind of thing. Um, and as you all are aware, in policing for decades, pretextual stops have been a means to determine whether or not someone might be guilty of a crime or have committed a crime. Did they steal something? There's evidence of that in the car, catalytic converters, whatever the case may be. So that has been the practice of policing for decades. But we're transitioning, and at least we should be, to intelligence-led and evidence-based. So we should be looking for the people where the intelligence indicates that those are the ones committing the crimes, because we all know it's a small percentage of the people who are responsible for a large percentage of the crime. So I'm interested to see what's happening in these other cities and states, and that could be an example of how we might be able to follow in their footsteps. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think some of that information is included in the 2022 um, RIPA Board, Racial Identity Profiling Act Advisory Board. Um, their report examines the problem of pretext stops, makes some recommendations to limit pretext stops and to end consent searches um, following pretext stops. And I think they examine a number of jurisdictions that have limited um, pretext stops, uh, non-moving violation stops, equipment searches, that sort of thing, um, and concluded that there wasn't an, a negative impact on, on crime rates, public safety. So uh, it will be helpful to look to those jurisdictions, I think. Um, I briefly touched on this in the intro, kind of got ahead. But um, yeah, I think there are alternative Alternatives to traffic stops would which not adversely impact public safety. Clearly, if you see a serious crime in in, in progress or, 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 or reason to believe that there's imminent danger to the community, we expect our law enforcement officers to act accordingly. But there are a lot of tweeners in between that I frankly don't think fall in that category and that people aren't worried about impacting their livelihood. Someone blown through a stop sign at um, 60 miles an hour in a neighborhood where there's kids playing. Yeah, you know, we're gonna put you know, red you know, lights on top and, and go after those, those individuals. But, you know, low level um, traffic in, in, in observations, um, expired uh, tags and registration, um, you know, maybe we could make those mail, uh, um, warnings or citations um, instead. Um, having more uh, red light cameras is certainly something that we know jurisdictions can do. And frankly, sometimes they go too far to just create revenues for their cities. Um, so there are real alternatives, I think that, that we can explore without jeopardizing uh, public safety. And that's gonna, I really appreciate the, the comments from our chief of police in San Leandro and we need you know, innovative thought like this. Um, you know, I don't think this is necessarily lawmakers passing new bills and laws. A lot of this is implemented by, you know, people in the field. Some of this is of course more training. Um, you know, we've done a lot of that, that work already having, you know, increased de-escalation training. It's not about holding accountables accountable for crossing the line. It's how do we prevent these things happening in the first place. Um, another big topic we had this year, I think is really important is um, the, the, the education requirements of law enforcement officers. You know, uh, research shows that law enforcement officers start the academy a little bit older and with more education, such as a, a degree, either an AA or bachelor's, are, are less likely to run into trouble where you have some of these incidents. And so there's certain things that we can do on the front end, which are, which are sound public policy that we need to be looking at as well. Thank you, assembly member. Yeah, and as, as the assembly member mentioned, you know, more generally, there have been a number of efforts uh, in recent years, whether at the state level or, or across the nation to increase training, diversify staffing, uh, 
uh, you know, making changes to sort of officer deployments um, in the community in a hope to better community relations and reduce racial inequities in policing. And so I'd like to give uh, both uh, Chief Pridgen and, and Adriana a chance to, to sort of add on to what the assembly member was talking about in terms of training and whatnot. And, and you know, what are, what are you seeing on the ground that, that might be helping sort of this larger um, community law enforcement interactions? And, 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 you know, do those trainings seem to be working? Are, are there other trainings that you might, you might see out there that could help sort of the larger issue going on? That's a really good question. And I will tell you from research and personal experience, I, don't, I haven't seen where implicit bias has demonstrably changed behavior. And I know that's one of the things that we run to to say implicit bias is going to change the way people interact, but we've got to be realistic about it. And these trainings are what, eight hours? But these people are inundated with pervasive themes about certain groups of people in society when they're not at work. So I think it has to be a few things. One, we're committed, like many other departments are, to increasing the number of women on our, our department because that's based on research, that they're more empathetic. Um, they're, they're more trusted and they make fewer discretionary arrests. So we're trying to increase the number of women on our department to 30% by the year 2030. Right now we're at seven. Um, so it's a significant challenge, but it's something that we're committed to. And I remember about three or four years ago, there was an article about Stanford that had done some research on those experiencing homelessness and trying to determine how they could increase empathy by others. And so they put them through virtual reality training and determined that people were more empathetic after having gone through this virtual reality training as opposed to just a standard classroom instruction. And maybe that's something that we can do with implicit bias, where you actually are putting someone in the shoes of someone else for a period of time to see what it feels like to be treated a certain way. And maybe that will increase the level of empathy and then a behavioral change to accompany that. So I think those are areas where there isn't enough research around VR training with respect to implicit bias, but I would love to explore that because the classroom instruction, from my estimation and the research I've read, does not work. Uh, to add on to that, I, I would say when we're talking specifically about the problem of racial disparities in traffic stops, um, I, I don't see training or even diversification of a department as a complete solution. Certainly some amount of the disparities seems to stem from individual biases of officers exercising their discretion and the, the PPIC report includes some evidence of that, but that's not in my experience what is responsible for a lot of the disparities that are occurring on the ground. Um, in my experience, those are happening because there is a directive that comes from the top to saturate particular communities that are predominantly black and brown um, with traffic stops and to repeatedly subject people in those communities to traffic stops and those result in racial disparities. Um, if you look at, for example, the report that came out of Los Angeles that was put out by um, the Push LA Coalition with Catalyst California showed that there were far more stops, far more stops for minor traffic violations um, when you looked at predominantly black neighborhoods, when you looked at low income neighborhoods, and um, there was a California Policy Center, I think, um, study that showed the same um, in terms of a correlation between gentrification and the number of low level traffic stops that are happening in neighborhoods. So. To me, it doesn't matter if officers are being trained not to be individually biased when the traffic stop practices of a department are programmatically racist. And I think when we're talking about solutions, we have to talk about that too. Thank you, Adriana. Before moving on to the next question, I do just want to remind our, our audience that we'll be moving to the audience Q&A in a few minutes. And so as a reminder, please submit your questions to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Please include your name and organization along with your question. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Before, before moving on, I do have um, actually a specific uh, question for Chief Pridgen um, about RIPA. And so, you know, the initial data collection started in 2018. It started with the largest agencies and over time has rolled out in waves. And so now as of January 1, 2022, virtually all agencies across the state are collecting RIPA data. And so I was just hoping if you could give the audience some sort of insight to, to what that has meant for your department, for your officers, um, if you were 
using that type of data before, how, how if you plan to use the data that comes out of RIPA, that would be, uh, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Oh, yes. Thank you for the question. So this is just over a year of my time here in San Leandro. So this, uh, the collection of RIPA data started several months after I got here. And January 1st of 2023 will be the first year that we have collected data. And historically, we have not collected that kind of data, not to that level of detail, you know, people being uh, asked to sit on the curb, be, being handcuffed, all those things. And I can assure you, we will be using that data to inform if there are any disparities, how we operate moving forward in consultation and collaboration with the community. Because ultimately what we are doing or should be doing is at the behest of our community. Uh, you know, every, this is a partnership. So if there are members of our community that are being disparately impacted by some of the practices and procedures that we have, let's have a conversation about what we need to be doing differently to ensure that these things aren't happening and we're not sacrificing public safety. And so I look forward to, I don't know what the data is gonna, gonna show, but historically, <laughs> any town USA, there's typically some disparate outcome in people of color being stopped. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'd like to sort of open it up more, <clears throat> more broadly to Adriana and the assembly member. You know, the RIPA board uh, was formed in 2016 and, and data started 20, in 2018. And so I didn't, uh, you know, I wanna give you a chance to comment on if there's specific um, things in the future that you think the board should be focusing on, you know, they, they have a duty to, to look at this and they produce a yearly report with the data. And so I'm, I'm just wondering your thoughts on, you know, what the board should focus on. Yeah, it, you know, Dr. Weber really pushed for this because, you know, we, we had known throughout communities in California what the conclusions were going to say, which is what the RIPA board um, data came out with and which PPIC analyzed. And so I think um, it's not rocket science, you know, to keep going forward and doing it again, because we already have it. I think the real question is, what are we going to do about it? And um, I, the chief outlined some policies um, we, we went through earlier. I think there are some, some, some real solutions that at the local level jurisdictions can do, we talked about earlier. Um, and um, I, I don't know uh, any specific task other than what they've done and we're appreciative of that. And, I'm glad that the bill was signed into law, it took a big push, um, and uh, we just need to move forward and not debate whether or not racial profiling does exist, because we know it exists in extreme in great numbers, and we have data that's crystal clear. So what are we going to do about it is the real question. Thank you, Assembly Member. I, I agree, and I think the um, advisory board's already done great work in in examining the problem of pretext stops and in issuing the recommendations I mentioned earlier to limit them and to end the practices of consent searches and also addressing um, supervision uh, investigations and searches. Um, so the practice of automatically asking people or certain people um, whether they're on probation or parole as soon as they're stopped in order to extend or prolong that, that um, stop. Um, I also thought it was very interesting that the board looked at bicycle stops because there are similar stop, uh, disparities in bicycling and pedestrian stops as there are in traffic stops. Um, so a, a continued um, look at that would be, I think, important as well. Thank, thank you. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for the, the great sort of moderated panel part. Um, now for the last 15 minutes, uh, we're going to begin our audience Q&A. And so we do have uh, a few questions. So the first question is um, from Martha Wright from the Judicial Council of California. And she, she says, um, AB 2773 was just enacted to require officers to first explain the reason for a stop and to document on it on the citation. Could any of the speakers tell us how they think AB 2773 might impact the situation going forward? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take a shot. <laughs> so there are already some Fourth Amendment limitations on um, how long pretext stops can last and what can happen in them. There's um, Supreme Court Ninth Circuit precedent that says that you really shouldn't be stopping someone longer than the reason that you stop them, like if just a cause to, to hold them for something else. Um, so if 
you know, X amount of minutes is what it takes to issue the citation, then that's how long the stop should be. Of course, that's not really what we're seeing reflected on the ground, um, but I think AB 2773 might be a first step towards documenting that sort of constitutional violation. And I will just add that it looks like it's codifying what we should be fully embracing and that's procedural justice. And that explaining to someone the reason why you stopped them, whether it be speeding or expired registration, whatever the case may be, so that you can increase the level of um, trust and legitimacy uh, during the stop. Because procedural justice, if you treat people with respect, need dignity and respect, regardless of the outcome, they're likely to be um, uh, more satisfied with the um, encounter. So I'm appreciative of that. Assembly member, did you want to add anything? No, I'm good. We'll get to the rest of the questions, so. Yeah, no problem. So the next question uh, comes from Josh Jackson with Arnold Ventures, um, which I, I do just want to note at this point that Arnold Ventures was uh, a funder of both the report and, and this event. Um, the laws for moving violations alone are so numerous that police officers can find a reason to stop anyone for a moving violation if they follow them long enough. For example, even the most careful drivers will likely not know how many feet you must travel between signaling and executing a lane change or a turn. How can we prevent police from simply relying on moving violations for what, essentially, what is essentially a pretextual stop? Yeah, I think that goes back to the earlier question is that there are many of these instances where, where if someone gets pulled over, it's a, either a warning or an infraction. And what can we do potentially doing these um, via the mail? And notifying people as opposed to having, you know, a high leverage traffic stop, especially at night, where we have potentially um, dangerous outcomes, not only for the person being pulled over, but also for the for the officer. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, the vehicle code is so expansive that essentially police have a blank check to stop people. I mean, I've just seen everything across the map from tire tread to they were slightly over the you know turn lane line to. Um, things on the dashboard. There's a number of things that could qualify as moving violations that can nonetheless be the basis for pretextual stops. And that's why I think it's so important that when we're talking about solutions, we talk about limitations on what can happen once the stop has occurred as well. Um, so limiting the scope and intrusiveness of stops um, that are that are conducted. Did you want to add anything, Chief? I'll just add quickly because we might have more questions, but that's where it goes back to intelligence led and data driven policing. And or if it's something that could impact public safety, maybe those are the things that we need to be focusing on. And once we get all the data that really will inform us about how our time is being spent, either judiciously or not, then we can refocus on things that will truly impact public safety in concert with our community. Thank you. Uh, the next question from a viewer in Sacramento which gets that to the wide diversity in the state uh, geographically and, and regionally and, and to what some of what the assembly member was saying earlier about, you know, not maybe needing new state legislation, a lot of policies at the local level. But the question is uh, for any of you, how do you think these issues identified in the report vary via rural work versus urban jurisdictions? Would the policy solutions differ in those lo localities as well? And I, I think it is, key too to point out that this data from 2019 is on the 15 largest agencies. So most of this is, uh, you know, large urban jurisdictions that's represented in the report. I think it may be a couple of ways to approach it. One is if we're looking and empowering jurisdictions to come up with solutions that mitigate disparate outcomes and, um, you know, overrepresentation of certain groups and stops at the same time, there should be some backstop if there is no progress being made with the data that they are using. There's got to be an opportunity for um, the legislature or DOJ to you know, hold departments accountable who aren't using that information to change behavior and outcomes. So I appreciate and I think it's important to allow people to have local control to determine what works best for their community. But at the end of the day, the outcomes need to change and there needs to be an accountability mechanism in place if they don't. 
And I'll just say that in, in my experience, the disparities um, are present in rural communities as well as in urban communities. Um, the next question, which I don't, I don't know if um, how much you guys might know about speed cameras, but it, it comes from uh, Rich Israel's JD candidate. So thank you for the question, Rich. Um, with speed cameras, is there any evidence that these technologies reduce incidents of bias and traffic? Stops. Well, I will say I, I don't know, but if they don't reduce bias, then those are the people that are speeding <laughs> because it isn't a discretionary decision as to who I'm going to stop and who I'm not going to stop. It's whoever is clocked speeding by will get the citation. I think if we are looking at um, how different technologies have been historically deployed, and we also look at where these technologies might be deployed. Um, if we're looking at high injury corridors, for example, uh, it, which are often in neighborhoods that have faced historical disinvestment, then we might be looking at uh, disproportionate deployment of these devices in the same neighborhoods that are currently being disproportionately subjected to pretextual stops. And if we're not additionally limiting pretextual stops and just adding on another layer of automated enforcement, and I think we may actually be in the situation of compounding inequity in the sense that we're imposing monetary sanctions on top of police stops on the same people. I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I came from a, a local government as well, where a city council installed these in high pro profile areas and they're extremely controversial and there are some privacy questions and, and, and back and forth. Um, as long as they are deployed in areas which have shown to have, let's say, high um, um, collision uh, reports or, you know, you know, pedestrian versus car type of a thing, um, as opposed to what our representative from the ACLU said, which is in certain areas where you disproportionately target an area. But um, I think, as our chief said, the, the, the evidence is the evidence, and it will go after the people that are, are most prone to do just that and, and drive uh, irresponsibly in our communities. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, we have uh, roughly about five more minutes left. So if there's any more questions, please, please send them in. Um, if not, I do want to ask a question. So there has been some, um, in some reports, there's been uh, recent reports have sort of shown that crime uh, may be on the rise from 2020 to 2021, which is the most recent sort of statewide data we have. And, and so I'm just wondering if anyone has um, wants to comment on that and what that might mean for, um, you know, looking to change enforcement of these stops when, when, you know, crime is on the rise. So there might be a pushback from police that these pretextual stops, you know, help bring down crime. It's interesting you asked that question because I was thinking, referring to the data from 2019, and then what's happening or what happened in 2021 with a proliferation of guns as a result of the pandemic. You had any and everybody buying a gun to protect themselves from someone who's gonna come take their toilet tissue or paper towels, I don't know. But ghost guns, so we're recovering many more guns now than we were prior to the pandemic. So I know that would be a concern for uh, most in law enforcement who see that as a potential limiting factor for violence. Um, but I'm one who likes to rely on data and research, and, and I've read a couple of articles, but I need to get peer-reviewed research, where it doesn't appear to be any correlation between the number of gun seized and any appreciable decrease in violent crime. And these are cities like Chicago and, and Baltimore, so I want to do some follow-up. Because if that's not the case, and I can tell you most departments are like, if we get guns off the streets, that's going to make our city safer. But if evidence suggests that, that that's not the case, we should be reevaluating what we're doing and why we're doing it. And as many of us know, there are so many things that contribute to crime. And it's not just, um, you know, police tactics, although that plays a role. It's education, it's healthcare, it's um, jobs. It's so many things that contribute to crime that an increase doesn't necessarily mean that police aren't as effective as they used to be. There's so many societal factors that impact that. So. Granted, it's something that we pay attention to as police and police chiefs and try to deploy our resources in a way that will potentially have an impact. But there are so many things that give rise to crime outside of police departments control. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that and just point out that it's not like California has stopped the practice of pretext stops in this period of time that we're talking about. It it was continuing and it didn't stem the the rise in crime. So um, perhaps now is a time to look at other solutions. Any anything, assembly member? No, I'm good. Okay, um, I actually do have a specific question for for the chief and I I think the audience would might be interested in you know given all the the sort of trainings and and you know community police relations over the last few years I, I'm just wondering if you could you know comment generally on um, you know hiring and, and if there's things the state could do to help in in hiring you were mentioning that you're trying to get to 30 percent women in your force um, and sort of just on the ground, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about um, early retirements from the profession of policing and, and how do we go best about filling those um, uh, retirements? That's a great question. I would say this is an unprecedented time in law enforcement, but it's not unique to law enforcement. Everyone is having difficulty hiring people right now, but it, it seems to be particularly acute in, in policing. And I can't think of anything um, right off the top that the state could be doing. One thing I will say is we still use polygraphs <laughs> and um, they disparately impact people of color. Um, and, and so although it is not a requirement that someone pass a polygraph, I don't know anyone in the state of California that's going to hire someone who failed a polygraph. So that is certainly a hindrance to people who would otherwise be great uh, police um, police officers. So that's the first thing that comes to mind, that that is frankly junk science that we're still using. <laughs> and there are other ways to elicit credibility and honesty outside of something that disparately impacts uh, people of color. Thank you, Chief. Um, Adriana, assembly member, you, do you wanna weigh in at all on hiring or, or support for hiring? No, just that we've, we've had this debate with um, our corrections officers and with law enforcement officers. And I think that, that we're onto something is that the, the education experience going into um, the people starting in the, in the force lead to better outcomes. And so um, I think that we need to, to, to lock that down in several areas throughout California. Well, great, thank you. Um, we are reaching uh, the end of our program, so I want to once again thank uh, Magnus for his presentation and, and thank you uh, panelists for the, the great discussion and, and, and answering our audience's questions. Um, you know, thank you again to our funders and thanks to all of you for joining us today online. If you pre-registered for this event, later today you will receive a survey. We'd appreciate it if you could take a couple minutes to respond and let us know how we did. Thank you again. Please be safe and have a great afternoon.